and we'll we'll give uh, folks also some time to to connect as as usual. Hey guys, happy to be in the call. Uh, everything great. Hey Hello. Gab. Hey Will. I don't know. I'm refreshing. So for everyone that is joining now, thanks for joining. By the way, we're uh, we're trying something new this time. We're trying to live stream uh, directly to to YouTube. Uh, I hear a echo echo here. So I guess uh, I guess we are live. Maybe. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm actually in, I can see it's working. Yeah, that's great. So uh, thanks again for joining just uh, for context. We're, uh, yeah, we're trying to live stream this to the YouTube Xerox channel. So we'll probably wait a couple of minutes until more folks will tune in. And the idea is that, um, um, well, usually we start recording the call before, uh, like, or actually a couple of minutes in, and we ask you, uh, we tell you that we are about to do it. And, um, but yeah, this time we try the, to have more engagement by all the subscribers of the channel live. And uh, hopefully we'll also be able to get more people to uh, ask questions live on the, on the comments chat, but yeah, it looks like it's working. Cool. All right, we'll three minutes in. Brent, what do you think? Shall we get started? All right, cool. All right, I guess, yeah, I can check it uh, directly on the stream. Yeah, you guys can see the, the slides. All right, welcome everyone to the March uh, Xerox Community and Governance meeting. Um, as always, this um, yeah, this call is held uh, roughly monthly by by Xerox Labs and the other Xerox uh, ecosystem participants. We'll go through the different uh, updates, uh, everything that happened in the last month, and uh, as you will see, we have actually a pretty packed agenda today. So we will start with the usual ecosystem snapshot. We will also go through the roadmap, a couple of updates around the latest ZIP83 vote. Fulvia is gonna walk us through the latest uh, updates of Xerox API. We're gonna talk about the imminent launch of a Xerox DAO. Uh, I bet a few folks that are here in the call are also interested in that. And we also have a, yeah, Will, in addition to Amir today to um, really share more details about the expansion of Xerox beyond Ethereum. It's definitely definitely an odd topic and people talked about it in, on Discord and on the forum. So uh, looking forward to that. We, we try to keep it under 45 minutes. Today we don't have a, a spotlight from the ecosystem. So hopefully we'll have more time to get an active discussion from, from everyone. So let's dive right in. I'll go real quick here, uh, ecosystem, Snapshot, last 30 days volume uh, hit 6.7 6 billion. We had um, 
yeah, substantial growth in number of active traders, almost 70,000. Number of trades pretty stable, and protocol fees have been, you know, continued, continuing to, to grow. Uh, we hit 700,000 protocol fees in the last 30 days. As always, make sure to bookmark Xerox Tracker. You will find all the all the insights there um, in different cuts, 24 hours, seven days, monthly, etc. Uh, in terms of recent ecosystem news, so we have a bunch of new Xerox API integrations, DexGuru, Parsec Finance, LinkSwap, uh, all the links are there. Uh, it's pretty exciting to see more and more applications going online. We, uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the ZIP83 vote in a second. And um, Fulvia joined um, uh, DeFi 2021 and beyond the panel at if Denver. Uh, definitely watch the recording there. Uh, and uh, yeah, very interesting conversations. Um, we got uh, featured, uh, this was a very interesting article, by the way, um, produced by the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. It's a DeFi research article. So uh, what I personally liked about it is, uh, well, not only that they mentioned Xerox, but it's a pretty good over, overview of the, of the industry. So you can send it to, to friends and family. I think it's pretty, pretty good. Uh, we got, um, yeah, recently, or we organized a couple of AMA, uh, Ask Me Anything, over Discord, and they were pretty good, actually. Uh, the latest one was uh, with uh, with KeeperDAO, so you can see a recap in, uh, in a blog post linked there. And also, there's going to be an upcoming one uh, in two days uh, with Open. So uh, make sure to... Uh, to, to ask your questions in advance uh, over Discord. And uh, the format is pretty good. Uh, it allows to be inter interactive enough and uh, but also has that live aspect to it. So, uh, and uh, yeah, still related to the ecosystem news, as you can see, perhaps also from uh, there are multiple people with having the same background, including me. Um, we produced, well, Brent and, and others produced a, uh, uh, an amazing um, blog post around pretty much an overview of the expanding uh, zero X ecosystem, which uh, in this uh, fantastic uh, infographic takes the the um, kind of a, becomes almost an universe in constant expansion. So you can see that we have the liquidity funnel represented here from liquidity suppliers and liquidity demand with all the, uh, the, the different uh, products and teams working uh, together and uh, API, Xerox API and Xerox protocol being kind of the, at the center of this universe. So pretty, pretty excited to see it painted in a, you know, in a, such a cool infographic here. So yeah, shout out to, to Brent and everyone else that worked on this. All right, let's jump into the development roadmap. Um, I'm not going to go through all the different details, just I'm going to focus on what has changed uh, over the last month. Well, we had um, the uh, ZIP83 about RFQ uh, order VIP fallback, the vote passed, and we're going to implement it this week. I'm going to share a couple of more details later. We also shipped a uh, uh, gas efficiency improvement for Curve and MuniSwap. So that should uh, pretty much result into better pricing. Um, for, for users, and uh, especially when the liquidity is sourced directly from Curve and Uniswap, Muniswap. We're going to launch soon uh, Xerox DAO. I'm going to share more details later. Xerox v4, v4 is now uh, used uh, in uh, Xerox API. Fulvia is going to share more about that. Sorry. And um, we also shipped Mesh uh, V11, which is a version that supports V4. And then finally, uh, yeah, there hasn't been a lot of um, uh, updates on the instant um, Gitcoin bounty. I'm not sure if uh, Joao is in the call and maybe can share the latest updates on this. I'm not sure if he's in the call. So Joao, if you want to jump in, feel free to do so. Hey. Uh, yeah. Uh, IQ, so uh, I'm still working on it, so... I hope this week have a more uh, a more advanced because I needed to use that on my internal app. So expected it to be shipped on. Uh, I will be working on these these weeks to to do it as fast as possible. Okay. Yeah. 
thank you very much. Thanks for jumping on this. Cool. And then, well, the late, the last Gitcoin bounty uh, posted here is about Xerox DAO. So I'm going to talk about it uh, later in a second. Um, as always, this is the list of the latest open discussions in the forum. Um, yeah, just encouraging everybody that is sh that is like tuned in uh, right now and is watching the recording. Uh, yeah, come to the forum. That's where most of the active discussions and open discussions are happening. And especially now with the launch of Xerox DAO, it will be very important to keep the, the conversations live and the engagement uh, on, and not only on Discord channels where maybe the, the conversation then loses, uh, gets diluted in the, the, the long streams of, uh, of, you know, back and forth. Here in the forum is good because we have an arc, almost, you know, a, a constant place where to, to look at things also uh, as the conversations evolve and it's easier to reference things. So yeah, continue contributing there and uh, also thanks to, for everybody that is showing up there. All right, let's jump into the actual details of uh, uh, and the deep dives of the, of the call. Uh, going really quick on this, um, thanks for, uh, to, to everyone that uh, showed up and voted on ZIP83. So I want to give a little bit more context uh, about what the impact of that is. And it's really intimately related with uh, RFQ orders. So as you remember, as we uh, posted the new updates around Xerox before, we said uh, RFQ liquidity is going to be 70% cheaper in gas. And uh, that was um, true for when the liquidity is uh, filled on its own, like directly. But typically, uh, what happens is that Xerox API provides a fallback to prevent reverts and bad user experience. And uh, we needed to do a couple of changes to make sure that Xerox API could fall back in a gas efficient way. So pretty much that was the, uh, the purpose of this upgrade. And um, basically, um, yeah, we're already seeing good uh, actually increase in RFQ liquidity even before launching this. And uh, since this is going live in about a couple of days, uh, we should expect even more RFQ liquidity flowing into uh, Xerox API. And just a quick reminder, RFQ is Xerox API exclusive liquidity. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, that, that basically is something pretty exciting that we are observing. Uh, the fact that, yeah, it's growing and it's becoming more substantial. So that pretty much reflects into better prices for Matcha users and old Xerox API users. As part of the same proposal, we also have a batch fill feature. So that's something that uh, our British bots and uh, market makers asked us to develop. It's pretty much a way to, as the name says, uh, fill multiple limit orders in one go. And uh, the effect of this should be in a higher likelihood of limit orders being filled by users and also like um, potentially even more protocol fee uh, being collected because again, limit orders can be filled more easily. All right, uh, if you have any questions around this, let me know. If not, I'll continue. Actually, I'll pass the, the floor to Fulvia for this. Awesome, thanks, Theo. Um, so just quickly, I wanted to give a few updates on uh, Sirix API now supporting uh, V4 of the protocol. So we've updated the swap endpoint and the SRA endpoints. Um, for the swap endpoint, if you are using our aggregation um, API, please notice that the, there's a new allowance target. Uh, by changing the allowance target, um, we are able to offer your users um, lower costs in every transaction. As of today, over 99% of uh, users that had used the allowance target uh, like the old allowance target have migrated, but for those that haven't, here are the new and the old allowance targets. Kylie encourages you to move over as soon as possible as we will be deprecating the old allowance target on March 31st. Um, the other thing that to be aware of here is that if you are using RFQ liquidity as part of your integration with the swap endpoint, um, we highly encourage you to update the taker address this must be a non-contract EOA address 
um, so that the market makers can actually provide uh, liquidity to you. If you have more questions about this, I'd be happy to answer uh, later in this conversation or through Discord or Telegram. Also, please notice that ver the previous version of Swap, so V0, will be deprecated on March 31st as well. Next slide, please. So for SRA, things are a bit a little bit different. So we actually have a breaking change for SRA. We are moving from SRA V3 to SRA V4. Um, allowances need to be updated as well to the Xerox Exchange proxy. I've added the allowance um, address there. But again, if you have any questions, please let me know. You can use protocol utils to create your limit orders on before. I've also included an example in the slides, um, and I think these will be shared later, right, Brent? Um, awesome. OK, um, you can also start signing limit orders and posting them um, as the example shown there. And all the available orders uh, will be, uh, you can retrieve them using the orders endpoint, uh, and you can filter by maker token or taker token. I've also attached a link to the, uh, the docs. They're still in draft, so if you notice uh, anything is missing or it's, like if there are any errors or bugs, please report them uh, and let us know uh, how we can improve them. And the swap V3 will be deprecated eventually, but we are still working uh, to, with some of our known integrators to define a date uh, to give them enough time for them to move over. So again, if you're using the SRA and you need more time to migrate to SRA before, do let us know so that we can take that into account uh, when deciding a date for deprecation. Thanks. Thank you, Fulvia. Any questions about this? I think uh, there are also shared in the blog post in case you guys need more details but yet this there's a bountiful year of of uh of references so before i move to xerox dao i actually yeah there was a question by daniel i see from the live stream he's asking what kinds of trading pairs professional market makers tend to use rfq for i think uh yeah i have this handy so i'm happy to answer that it's mostly right now if with the uh, other four pa other four tokens so if usdc if DAI, if usdt and if wbtc that's currently where we see the most activity all right i'll just move on then i'm gonna talk about xerox DAO now um i'm gonna go through real quick the yeah, the, the overall updates around the Xerox DAO, I think we went through this uh, last uh, last month as well, but there are a couple of uh, new uh, you know, details that maybe uh, we might not, not have touched last time. The first one is around, well, for those that don't know, uh, we're gonna launch an on-chain binding governance function controlled, fully controlled by Xerox holders and uh, Xerox uh, stakeholders, so including staking pools and delegates. This on-chain binding governance will manage a community treasury. Um, so there won't be any need for Xerox Labs intervention anymore. This is the first step to uh, you know, fully decentralized governance of the, of, the, of the protocol. We will start from a treasury, but then we will expand it later to perhaps protocol parameters and ultimately to arbitrary protocol up updates. The treasury will be initially seed funded by Xerox Labs. And uh, we roughly decided to get started with a 2 million ZRX uh, amount. Current prices, basically the treasury will fluctuate between 2.5 and $3 million. There are different models where we can see this evolving. We could, for example, plug in a portion of the protocol fees to be directed here. We will see that later, I think, and subject to the, to the, to the community direction and, and voting. We will decide what to do but i think uh, this is going to be very exciting again uh, i'm going to go through the the process but also i want to again reiterate the fact that this treasury is in, in your control um, we are all like part of this and uh, we should feel responsibilized and accountable for making sure that these funds are are used in the best way possible uh, this could be but it's not limited to paying you know um, for example 
developers buildings you know experiences or projects around uh, you know zero x could be used for uh, marketing um, or other types of incentives it's really up to the community to debate over the forum and on discord and uh, then show up and vote about how to use them so i'll go through the high level details of the process um, there are roughly three phases four phases so the, the most important one actually is the first one which is really the discussion as, as i mentioned it's important that a community discusses on the forum and other communal venues like discord about ways on how to use this treasury again could be grants marketing investments that's the very first uh, planning phase that is very important once that is done um, anyone really can propose a vote the only thing that is needed is that uh, they need to be uh, to have enough voting power to uh, propose to submit the transaction uh, right now the current threshold is set at 100,000 zrx um, but it can be updated via via vote. Um, only if that threshold is met, the proposal can be staged. And usually, the yeah, we wait at, at least one epoch before uh, having the vote going live. So again, anyone can submit the transaction. The, the the proposal will be staged. So then vote goes live in epoch plus two. Vote will last 72 hours, as always, one ZRX, one vote. And obviously, um, there's always the mechanism by which staking pools get 50% of the voting power of the stakers, so they are able to accumulate voting power there. Voting power stays constant throughout the voting period. Uh, yeah, something that we didn't mention last time, maybe, um, we are going to upgrade ZRX portal to support this new type of voting. So uh, together with uh, you know, the classic ZIPs that you've seen even last week, for example, uh, we will have basically treasury votes. So this is a screenshot, obviously. Uh, but the interesting thing is that uh, yeah, anyone now will be able to inject votes into the system, and they will show up in ZRX portal automatically. And uh, yeah, this is pretty similar to what's happening with uh, Uniswap and Compounds governance. And again, there will not be needed intervention by ZRX Labs. Everything will be automated. Finally, uh, obviously, uh, if uh, there's a majority of votes that are in support of the proposal, and there's a, a quorum that is met, currently set at 10 million ZRX, the vote will be basically executable. The proposal can be executed. and. Uh, that can be a custom time lock set depending on the needs of the proposal. That's the overarching high level overview. What we haven't shared last time because we took you know, a few weeks to, to finalize is that uh, we're going to have bootstrap delegates. So this is the list of uh, we, found, we socialized the list over the forum in the last week or so. But these will be the representatives uh, of uh, you know, the, basically the Xerox ecosystem uh, community, they will be delegated voting power by from Xerox labs in order to be autonomous in creating proposals and having enough voting power to basically make decisions. So I'm going to go through the list. Some of you, I think, are also present in the, in, in the call right now. We have Nikita, son of Pegasus, Joao, who just, who just talked uh, just earlier, uh, Joey from Volifier, uh, the DeFi Saver team, uh, the Build Finance, the, 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 the developer responsible for, for metric product uh, is going to be present too. Open just today signed up to help us there. And also uh, Gabriele from Rigo Block, who's uh, I believe in the call here. So I want to thank everybody uh, here for, for stepping up. It'll be, again, an interesting uh, um, first step towards a, a decentralized protocol. Yeah, I'm excited that we got started with this. And from, from these people, from these teams and individuals, you should expect them to, you know, hanging out, obviously, uh, on the Discord channels, watch the Xerox forum, but also you can rely on them to actually create proposals and it, because they will have enough voting power to do so. And um, also we expect them to champion the, the, their own proposals and their positions, but also, yeah, make sure that they 
they declare what their positions are um, on, on specific proposals and also participate in other communities and find opportunities to cross-pollinate ideas. Uh, I believe the next part is on, yeah, the expansion of a zero X beyond Ethereum. So I want to stop for a second if there are questions about zero X DAO. Um, going through the, the chat. Brent, did you see anything related? Or I don't know if anyone wants to. All right, thanks. Cool. So I think uh, we can jump to the next section. If there are no questions. OK. Will, I believe you're in the call. So do you want yeah, to walk us through the slides? Thanks. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Theo. Hey, everyone. Good to see you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. So. I, I think the next section will not be too surprising for folks on the call who've been following the project uh, for any uh, amount of time. Um, but yeah, we've been, you know, well, I, I guess, first of all, like, you know, our, our mission at Zero X Labs is to create a tokenized world where all value can flow freely. And why, you know, Amir and I initially set out to, um, build zero X protocol is because we envisioned a world where all forms of value would end up tokenized on public blockchains. So, you know, uh, anything from like traditional securities, like stocks, bonds, debt instruments, video game items, airline miles, fiat currencies, you know, everything of value will end up represented as tokens on public blockchains. And in, in order for, you know, these assets to be liquid, there needs to be a um, protocol in place that allows, uh, allows people to exchange these assets in a peer-to-peer -peer way. And, uh, you know, I, I think since early on, we've known that, a, you know, Ethereum, uh, well, actually, when we, when we first started working on 0x, Ethereum was, I think, still in its like frontier stage or in, in just kind of exiting its frontier stage. So it was, it was, Ethereum itself was still a very early project and we knew Ethereum wasn't the end state. Uh, and, you know, Ethereum itself would be evolving rapidly, um, but also like the broader kind of crypto ecosystem would be uh, evolving as well. And it seems like, um, recently with ethereum we've kind of reached the point where uh there's so much activity there's so much product market fit for ethereum so many people want to use it um, that the block space has become uh, extremely valuable and we're starting to see uh, users branch out onto other networks uh, besides ethereum uh, and we think that this is just kind of the beginning of a broader trend where uh, Ethereum is going to kind of be at the nexus uh, of a network of networks where there are many different blockchains that are being used by people. Um, these might be other layer one blockchains that have their own, uh, their own consensus, or these could also be like layer two blockchains that uh, are you know, inheriting Ethereum's uh, security guarantees. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, this is something that we've been thinking about for a really, really long time. Uh, in 2020, we started thinking about what is the process that we should use to determine which blockchains to expand to and when, when to make that decision. Uh, and so in, in the following slides, we'll talk a little bit about that framework. Uh, so how we've been looking at these different blockchains and kind of evaluating them. Uh, and, uh, you know, in this slide here, you know, we're, we're just showing 
a handful of the different networks that we're excited about. It's not comprehensive. There are many really cool projects out there that we're excited about. We're also, I mean, I, I, I hope it doesn't need to be stated explicitly, but I'll say it anyway. We're extremely excited about Ethereum uh, and Ethereum's 2.0 roadmap as well, obviously. You know, we wouldn't be here today without Ethereum. Um, so yeah, I think we can we can maybe dive in to our framework for evaluating different blockchains. Uh, well, okay. I guess this this isn't really our our framework for how we're evaluating blockchains, but this is this is kind of like the sequence of steps that we're um, that we think makes the most sense when we when we have determined a new blockchain is worth kind of colonizing. Uh, I might I might have sorry will to interrupt maybe the, yeah the, the follow this is the slide where we kind of uh, state a little bit more in detail the framework if that's more helpful I think I just. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, this is helpful. I, I think it is worth just talking a little bit about how we're evaluating uh, other blockchains just generally. Uh, I, I just, yeah, I think it's it's helpful context. And this slide's perfect. So, yeah, there are a number of factors that we're looking at when we're evaluating other blockchains. Uh, as I mentioned, this is something that we started doing uh, in 2020. So we were working on 0x chain uh, internally, which was like our own uh, internal scalability solution that um, you know we still plan to have on our roadmap, but we determined the time wasn't right. You know, zero the timing isn't right for zero X chain. Uh, we need to see where users end up going, and then meet them where they are, rather rather than trying to build this new technology and kind of convince users to come over and, and start using it. Uh, instead, let's let's see where users end up. Uh, you know, migrating over time, and then we'll make sure that zero X protocol uh, and the entire kind of technology stack is available for them wherever the uh, wherever these networks uh, kind of happen to be. And so, yeah, on on that note, like there are a number of factors to consider when we're looking at new blockchains. But as I alluded to uh, just now, like probably the most important factor is are there users there. Uh, is there uh, like a user base on this blockchain that will actually uh, use the uh, you know use the smart contracts, use our technology stack? And if not, you know, it, you know it, it's 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 kind of pointless. Uh, so that that has to be the first ingredient. Uh, other factors to consider are kind of like the technical proximity of uh, you know a, a different blockchain to Ethereum. So, you know, how does the consensus work? Uh, is it using the Ethereum virtual machine or does it have its own model? Uh, you know, what, what are the block times? Uh, what's the gas limit? And then finally, like, uh, what, what is like the friction for bringing users onto that blockchain? Uh, and, and so like a big, big piece of that is like, can you use MetaMask to uh, access this new blockchain? Uh, and, and you know the reason why this is important is because if there are you know people that are already using Ethereum and they have their MetaMask wallet set up, um, it you know they're also much more likely to take advantage of of other networks that exist out there uh, versus you know trying to get someone to kind of set up a wallet and and start using a blockchain for the first time. Uh, and so we've we've been talking with around a dozen different layer one and layer two teams over the last uh, a long time, uh, six to 12 months, kind of just having on ongoing conversations and like evaluating their tech. And uh, as this slide shows, we've also been monitoring uh, the amount of uh, trading volume that is taking place on DEXs that exist on, you know, all of these different blockchains here. Uh, so on the y-axis, you can see the dollar value of trading volume, and then on the x-axis, it's time. Uh, and yeah, it's pretty cool. Like one, one thing that I think uh, Uniswap, Uniswap's, you know, 
innovated in a ton of different ways and completely changed the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, one thing that I didn't necessarily foresee, but I think is really interesting, is that Uniswap's also kind of become like the first building block that is ported over to new blockchains and is kind of used to spark, you know, little DeFi ecosystems on all these different networks. Uh, and so in, in this slide, you know, there there are, you know, 10 or so different blockchains listed. Um, and a lot of them just are EVM blockchains and they have a fork of Uniswap uh, running locally uh, and, and, you know, have been able to bootstrap a little bit of volume. Uh, but yeah, this is something that we've been monitoring over time. Nothing really comes close to Ethereum today. Uh, Binance Smart Chain has, you know, gotten significant traction uh, recently, and it seems like there's a pretty serious effort on on the Binance team's end to to um, yeah continue to drive users to Binance Smart Chain, which is pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, that's that's a little bit more about how we've been looking at blockchains uh, more broadly. Can we go to the previous slide? So once we identify a blockchain that kind of fits our criteria, that looks like it makes a lot of sense for us to kind of establish like a zero X protocol colony or like embassy uh, that you know exists alongside kind of zero x protocol on ethereum um, we we've thought about what is like the sequence of steps that makes the most sense for us to take uh, to kind of expand zero x from you know onto this new chain uh, and so yeah this uh, this table kind of kind of lays it out uh, instead of kind of taking the entire system uh, and you know, investing a ton of engineering resources to take every single piece of our tech stack that currently exists on Ethereum and supporting this new chain, no, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of focus on porting over the pieces that will let us get um, a stronger signal from users on whether there really is an opportunity that makes sense for us to continue pursuing. Uh, and so let's say for example, if we were to build on like, and this is purely an example on Polygon, like what would be the first step? So step one, we would uh, port uh, Matcha to support Polygon alongside uh, Ethereum. Uh, we would also add Polygon support to ZeroX API. Uh, we would look at all the different sources of liquidity that exist on Polygon. And, you know, as part of uh, launching ZeroX API support, we would aggregate all of these sources of liquidity uh, in the same way we currently do on Ethereum. Uh, why would we do this? It's a relatively low risk uh, way for us to test whether there's actually organic user demand to, to trade assets on, on this new blockchain. Uh, we can you know, get more familiar with uh, peculiar, peculiarities uh, that are associated with that blockchain. and uh, also allows us to, um, yeah, kind of identify where, where there are gaps that, that we'll have to think about filling uh, if we're going to be, you know, making further investments in supporting that blockchain. Uh, so what's needed for Matcha, we need wallets. Uh, so for, for EVM blockchains like Polygon um, and, and others like MetaMask works out of the box, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to run through what's needed. I think this is all like pretty self-explanatory. Uh, so if so, if we launch Xerox API and Matcha on this new blockchain, and we see that there are in fact users and they're interested in in these markets, then you know we have the signal we need to continue investing. And what we would do at that point is we would uh, add support for re our request for quote system, so professional market makers can start you know tapping into that user base and providing you know more more competitive pricing uh, and if you know we continue to see traction there then it would make sense for us to um, you know think about supporting uh, you know mesh peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, censorship resistant 
uh, universal order book. And, and you know, it, it, once we do that, open order book liquidity becomes uh, an option. And so at this point, you know, the entire zero X tech stack would be present on this new blockchain, except for the token economics and the governance. And so that would be the final step uh, is, you know, introducing protocol fees, uh, kind of hooking up the economics associated with Xerox protocol on this new blockchain, kind of hooking that up uh, in a coherent way with the economics that exist on Ethereum today, uh, and you know, kind of tying these systems together. Uh, yeah, and I, I should say that, you know, the when we do, you know, when we do start uh, deploying. Zero X protocol to other blockchains, and we we introduce the economics on these other blockchains. It's it's likely that we won't have like a super uh, kind of like a it, you know it might not be like a perfect solution at, at the beginning. It might be that like we have uh, like little economic systems that function in isolation on each individual chain, and they aren't all kind of connected up in a coherent way as a start. But you know, long, long term, the idea would be that zero X chain would be uh, kind of like this hub that um, you know connects into all of these different blockchains where zero X protocol exists and uh, is is able to kind of like unify the economics that take place on all these chains uh, and also you know uh, kind of unify liquidity that exists across these different chains. But that's a really ambitious technical challenge and. Yeah, one thing that we've we've definitely learned uh, over the last few years is that uh, just solving a technical challenge doesn't mean that the users will be there. So we need to focus on where the users are and, and meet them where they are first. Uh, next slide. I think, uh, yeah, we're done with the slides around uh, this topic. There's definitely a lot to unfold our details that can be, you know, uh, yeah, where we can dig deeper on. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure if Will, you want to stress any any point here or anyone wants to ask questions. I think we're, we're done with the main content for today. Yeah, happy to, happy to answer any questions about, uh, well, I, I'm happy to focus on like the the expanding to other blockchain sections, and yeah, my teammates, I'm sure, can can help answer questions on the other sections. Hey, I, I want to make a, a question regarding the this expansion. So, what are the strategies from Zero X team to avoid clones like uh, Uniswap is having on the other chains? There is some kind of strategy to onboard. Uh, I abordered this topic on the forum, but uh, I would like to, to hear about it. because uh, <clears throat> uh, zero X limit orders are uh, re really good. So we we expect it to, to be the next project to be cloned if the zero X team not do it first. So there is strategies to, to avoid these or uh, this kind of uh, clone uh, behavior is encouraged. How 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 it will how it works there. Um, there will be incentives for uh, from zero x team or zero x team will be doing all these uh, implementations in each uh, network yeah that's a really good question how appreciate it yeah it's, so uniswap has yeah uniswap clones have been extremely successful not only on like other blockchains but just on ethereum like literally you, you know sushi swap literally just cloned Uniswap and deployed it right alongside Uniswap, and you know it's been like really successful. I think, I think one of the reasons why these clones have been super successful is because uh, Uniswap just it, it's like it doesn't require a ton of uh, like sophistication to just you know spin up a pool, like spin up a market, and and have it function. Like all you really need is just like a ton of capital to throw at that market. And if you throw enough capital at it, then, you know, it'll work. And, and so like, that's, that's probably Uniswap's greatest innovation 
is that it lowered the barrier to entry to create new markets uh, from scratch. So yeah, it, you know, now anyone in the world can kind of spin up an, uh, a liquid market if they have enough capital to put behind it. Uh, whereas before you had to rely on professional market makers that are super sophisticated and have all of this like specialized infrastructure. So I, I think that's why Unisoft has been super successful. And when it comes to 0x and like potential 0x clones on other chains, I think, well, there's a few things. I think like first, it's going to be a lot more work to port all of our technology stack over. Like you can get the smart contracts copy and pasted on a different chain. Um, but like you're, you're not going to have like, um, you know, 0x mesh up and running. So, you know, you'll probably be storing orders in like a database. And that might be fine for some use cases, but uh, for other use cases, you don't want to have all of the markets, uh, you know, liveness depending on a single database that's being run by like some random person. You probably want something that's distributed and can't be taken down very easily, like mesh. And so, yeah, porting mesh to a new blockchain would be a ton of work. Um, need like really, really good engineers to do that. And I, I think that it would be a big undertaking. Um, another thing, you know, we, you know, we've worked really hard to like build relationships with professional market makers and like, it isn't, you know, one of the cool things about Uniswap is that like anyone can go and be a, a liquidity provider. Like you don't have to know anything. You can just go and like throw some like assets in this contract and you're now a liquidity provider. And like, but, but yeah, like professional market makers, like they really aren't as decentralized as that. Like there's, there's like a, you know, like maybe a dozen or two dozen like really legit companies that are providing uh, or that are market making on decentralized exchanges nowadays. And, you know, they want to be working with a team that is providing them with technical support. They want to be working with a team that has like, you know, like really good smart contract development chops because yeah, I mean, you don't want to be trusting smart contracts with, with your, you know, with your money if you if you're not like confident in the team that that wrote the smart contracts um and and so i would say like having a relationship with like these these market makers like they they know us and they trust us and i and i i feel like they um they would want to see uh see, fragmenting the ecosystem wouldn't be in their best interest uh and then finally, like there's there is like Matcha and Xerox API. Like, you know, we we've invested like years and years of our lives into Xerox protocol, and like I don't know, I don't. I feel like we wouldn't want to like support a fork of Xerox on Matcha or Xerox API if like unless we like really had to. If the community wanted us to do it, like I, I guess we could do it. But I don't know. It would kind of like uh, not really make make sense for us to like proactively support a fork of zero x um but yeah that's kind of my take another question that uh, i have it's i i look at that minus smart chain and uh, one of the weak points is the bridge is zero x team looking at doing doing this bridge trustless like uh, we have zero x chain doing this or natively using some kind of strategy to basically bridge assets between chains without needing, for instance, the Binance DEC, sec, uh, Binance Centralized Exchange. I check at Avalanche, they, ha they have as well a centralized bridge. Uh, so you guys uh, look at, the, at this kind of uh, bring uh, the, uh, trustless and decentralized bridges integrating on zero x chain or is possible to do this other way yeah that's a good point uh so i think in in the world where like zero x chain exists and it's plugged into all of the different networks where 
zero X protocol is deployed. Like, I, I think that is like definitely functionality that people would, would want and something that we would be excited to build. That being said, I do think that's like a longer term roadmap item. And today there are teams that are fully invested in solving the problem of, of like, you know, cross, you know, bridges between chains, like, uh, like Ren and uh, the Keep team, uh, you know, using like multi-party computation so that you can, you know, put assets in the custody of like a randomized crowd of people and not, not you know, none of them can like kind of team up to, to see funds. I, I think like that general approach is really interesting. Um, and the teams that are already working on it are probably better equipped to, to, to you know, move the, those projects forward than we are at this point. Um, I know that they're not perfect yet. Like Ren, apparently like Ren's multi-party computation code is not open source right now. And I think TBTC or Keep, Keep is open source, but um, there's like also some like UX issues with, with it. Um, but the technologies, you know, there's really smart people that have a really strong financial incentive to like solve these problems. And I think that they will. Um, when it comes to like Binance Smart Chain, I, you know, if, if, if we support, or I guess we should say like, you know, at some point in the future, when we support Binance Smart Chain, um, I, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to launch a decentralized asset bridge. That's not something we would be able to do, but, I think that, yeah, I, I think that's an, it, there, there are already, there's already kind of like a self-sufficient little ecosystem going on on Binance Smart Chain. And I, I think like the asset bridges, yeah, I don't know. They're definitely important. Um, but if you're going to use like a centralized provider of a bridge, like Binance does a pretty good job with custody historically. Like, I, you, you know, if, if you had to trust like your digital assets to be custodied by anyone, like it'd probably be like Binance or like Coinbase or something like that. And, and so I, I do think like their centralized solution is like a decent stopgap that we can use um, or that some people can use uh, in the short term. So uh, <laughs> it's last last question. So how far uh, we are uh, from uh, going to other chains, or uh, there is uh, not uh, still meted all the criteria needed to deploy on other uh, other chains. So we we want to. I I think it would be really awesome if 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 zero X protocol existed on like between three and five different blockchains by the end of twenty twenty one. I, I wouldn't be surprised if if it was three to five different blockchains. Um, as far as like timeline for when you know deploying to like blockchain number two, I um I think it could be not too long. I don't know. We're we're actively experimenting with stuff and and right now and yeah, we just want to make sure that if we do launch anything, that it's like solid and production ready and yeah. Uh, I just want to jump in with a, a comment about uh, trustless bridges. I think they're obviously going to be super, super important. Um, I think there are a number of teams already working on them uh, and I would expect them to start getting some decent use soon. I know Andre from Yearn, uh, kind of recently launched something called multichain.xyz. I'm not actually sure how it works at a technical level yet, um, but kind of a, a bridge between several different EVM chains. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully, you know, some of these start getting traction and, and we start seeing liquidity in these uh, bridge tokens. Uh, I also want to add like another reason it's super important is because I, I view it as like, a blocker to fully roll out uh, like governance or staking on any other chain. Like 
you know, we, we don't really want to use a, like a custody pegged, you know, ZRX token or, or something like that. Ideally, we would use a, a trustless version. Uh, so until then, I would expect the token economics and, and governance to kind of remain on Ethereum. Well, I think there there are okay. I think there's like a couple that have pretty compelling usage and adoption, and the, right now today, and I think those would be Binance Smart Chain and uh, Polygon, uh, previously known as Matic. Uh, and so, yeah, Binance Smart Chain is Binance's. You know, they they rolled their own e version of Ethereum, and it has its own uh, consensus. And then Polygon uh, is is a side chain to Ethereum. Um, Optimism is launching this month. They're they're launching their main net this month, and I think like you know since it isn't live, we don't have any adoption metrics to point to that would indicate that you know it, that that we should launch there like today or like immediately, but. I, I think like from a technical standpoint, it's like a really compelling solution. And um, yeah, I think like generally the Ethereum ecosystem is really excited about optimism. And and I wouldn't be surprised if there's like a thriving DeFi ecosystem on optimism pretty soon after they launch. And so we would look we would look for that to happen. And you know, I, I think it will be a front runner. I think the smart contracts are about as optimized as we feel comfortable making them without like some wacky, like some wacky design decisions. So I, I think like the, the smart contracts, the Xerox protocol smart contracts are like really, really well designed and really efficient from a gas standpoint. Um, but yeah, I think like expanding to multiple blockchains and, and also having like end user users, you know, it, being able to engage with different blockchains like that in itself is kind of like a way of load balancing use and, and hopefully like stabilizing gas prices. Also, uh, EIP 1559 is like a, a huge change that's coming to Ethereum, uh, I think in July. And that completely like completely changes how, uh, how ga gas prices work in Ethereum. And I, I think that that could be like, that could be one way of like avoiding massive spikes in gas price when, when there's like congestion, like periods of congestion, that could, that could actually be really helpful. But if I had to guess like Ethereum's gas prices are gonna be really expensive going forward, like indefinitely, like it, it it's just too good. Like Ethereum is too good. Like there's too many people that wanna use it and there's too many cool things you can do with it. And so people are gonna, Pay, pay a premium to do that. Yeah, well, I don't want to add anything. Uh, really, just making sure that everybody knows that there's a, there are a couple of slides in the in the deck that we're gonna share about ecosystem job opportunities and also references on how you can get involved with the project and help out. But yeah, with the upcoming launch of Xerox DAO, there's definitely a lot that everyone can do. So with that, I think we can close it. Yeah, we're out. We're right at, at the hour. So. Yeah, see you next month. And uh, yeah, looking forward to more discussions over the forum on Discord and everywhere else. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.
Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, bye. Thanks, everyone.